right that's there that's there that's there that's running i'm recording uh i that's good okay uh <laughs> oh dear Ah, oh, you'd think after having done the best part of 200 of these i'd be better at them but no of course not um Emily, uh, hello. <laughs> hello. To you again. Hello, nice to nice to have you uh, joining us. We're what's funny is uh, I, I mean, we'll hello everyone. It's Real Natter. Um, it, it is that we uh, we talked about this being the first episode that you and I would do, uh, and and then I ended up uh, involving you in in two uh, what I would describe as um, entertaining nonsense uh, episodes, uh, rather than actually discussing the quite important serious you know uh, joyful but but serious and, and uh discussion that we were otherwise going to have so now finally we're having that slightly more serious a slightly less nonsensical discussion um the nonsensical ones have been great though i had a huge amount of fun particularly on our our, our, our first episode together was a tour de force uh, of, of eating a load of stations it was brilliant um I, we, we have to think of a follow-up for that at some point uh, what else can we eat on the railway anyway um this episode is uh, how to make railway fandom a bit more inclusive uh, this is a, a subject close to both of our hearts, actually, um, for a variety of reasons, possibly different reasons. For me, it's selfishly because the more people find the railway a a accessible from a, an interest point of view, the more chance they are going to be interested in fighting for it, But that, which I suppose is partly a, a, an interest you have uh, on your side, Emily. But I think yours is is, is, is a more personal connection with the, the story as well. We'll get to that. We shall get to that. Um, we are indeed going to be talking about... Uh, Railway enthusiasts. Uh, here's one. Um, here he is. Yeah, Francis. I mean, I mean, there are plenty of legitimate criticisms of Francis, but I think the response of the rail enthusiast fraternity to Francis at large was kind of tapped into what we've talked about, Emily. It's kind of tapped into the thing you talked about, right? I think there's an element of, like, obviously there's people not wanting people to see sort of this him is this this is what a rail enthusiast looks like and almost seeing it as sort of a parody yeah. but at the same time he has got a lot of people interested in railways and i find i don't think we should be dismissive of that just because if people don't like what he's doing that doesn't mean that anyone who decided to come to a railway event because they saw a francis bourgeois video uh it doesn't diminish we should, them yeah we shouldn't be excited about that you know we shouldn't give them more information but i think it's just seen as like this is a fad let's dismiss this because we don't like what he's doing yeah exactly and you could say that for all you know you could that you could level that criticism at anyone who brings people uh, interested in the railway you could level it at jeff and say oh jeff's london centric or this uh, or you could level it at me saying oh he's a he's a socialist and he just bangs on about politics the whole time it's not very interesting you know like you could level the, you could select a series of criticisms and level them at anyone who potentially provides a doorway into, into the industry and, and and you know fine but it's interesting to unpick some of the deeper prejudices under that which i think is what we might end up doing a bit this episode um but in order to progress the episode i have to make the um the in intro credits come up and for once emily you can actually hear them live well because of the new audio setup anyway um everyone welcome to tonight's rail natter <laughs> the in city 225 fades away you know what's nice is that i can actually now even when if i have guests speaking through the intro i can just mute them it's great oh, you weren't of course emily because you're a consummate professional but um uh, yeah i have the capacity to do that and i've also colored the slider in blue because i'm a big nerd so it rem reminds me that that's what the skype one is uh, anyway um before we talk about what on earth a railway enthusiast is let's have a proper hello to Let's say hello to Emily properly. Emily, hello, hello. Hello. It's it's nice to nice to see you again. Very much uh, uh, confirmed friend of the show now that you've been on. Th this is your third episode uh, with us, which is lovely. Um, uh, you've have you changed location? There is there are other interesting things going on behind yes, you now. Yeah. So I'm usually in the office, but uh, Paul, my partner, is conducting railway related job interviews in the office right oh. now. So golly, <laughs> someone being hired by. <laughs> by tfl so um yeah i'm now in the living room which hopefully his pet chinchilla will not make too much noise in the corner Aww. and is otherwise just uh quite a lot of model trains we have yeah we 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 now have a we've hijacked east midlands railways uh mascot this is 
This is Miles, they, them. Uh, Miles is coded uh, NB, uh, according... Uh, I like, absolutely. Is. I know they refer to him as he every now and then in their adverts, but I'm sorry. Weird yeah, that's little, that's weird little NB. Binary animal. Absolutely. Creature, like, pillow? Like, I don't know, is it like a scatter cushion person? I'm not entirely sure, but I don't know why I've become absolutely obsessed with Miles. So I was very pleased to get an exclusive Miles sent to me by a, a, a connection at East Midlands Railway. So yeah, we, uh, uh, Miles is not a chinchilla and will not make any noise, but I'm quite keen for chinchilla noises, actually. That'd be quite fun. Um, Emily, how are, since, so since we last spoke before Christmas, um, how are you? How, you how, how are things? How, how, what, what have you been up to? Good. Um, yeah, it's been a. I've been doing a lot in the past. Well, I'm not doing a lot right now. I was doing a lot in previous. Well, yeah. So in February, I did my journey on bus on yeah. local buses from London to Edinburgh, which unexpectedly went a lot more viral than I could. <laughs> People have People love those bus journeys. They always it, it absolutely confirmed viral content. Yeah, yeah. I was just like, love it. Oh, this is just something I'll do. And suddenly I had 20,000 new Twitter followers. <laughs> I was like, what is going yeah. on here? Um, yeah. And then I have got to speak at a lot of things, got to, it's interesting doing this, this, uh, you know, talking about railway enthusiasm or transport enthusiasm more generally, mm. still have massive imposter syndrome, which is probably some of the things we'll get into yeah. later on. Yeah. But yeah, speaking at events and things, and then we would bought an interrail pass to use, so I went to Istanbul and back. So I've, yeah, I've really sort of upped my transport knowledge and game in the past. The, uh, this, the mistake you make is being uh, interested, engaged uh, in the subject matter, and, uh, and, and that the risk of that and the risk of being a smiley, uh, sprightly, enthusiastic person um, is that people want you to <laughs> come and talk to them about things. Um, yeah, no, it's fantastic. That that thread was brilliant. I mean, I, it, it just bus journeys are always it, it just. I, I can understand. Was it political animal? There's a, a, a yeah, fet, sure. political animal also did a, a, a viral bus journey, and there's something always interesting. It's just that that insight into the world that you, you frankly don't get when you do a railway journey again yeah. and likewise you don't get that when you fly somewhere so it's like a cat like you step down like the railway whizzes through the countryside and you get a lovely transect but it's much quicker buses is a much more intimate way to to, to see and understand the, wor the world yeah. and and it's so many people connected with it it's like oh that's the bus i used to take to school or that's the bus that i took to visit my cousins on sundays or whatever and so i think there is that that personal association people have with buses whereas Trains are usually sort of a bigger day out kind of yeah. thing, but the buses are part of people's day to day life. Yeah, certainly, certainly outside of London, you know, you, I think people have that connection with trains in and around London for, for, to be honest, similar reasons that it was a regular part of their life. Whereas outside of London, the reality is we don't have suburban rail networks, so the bus is what people use to to get about and. Pretty much everyone, other than a few very strange uh, monocle wearing people, have used have taken the bus, have a familiarity with the bus. The uh, yeah, the uh, the three hundred seven was my local bus from Inverurie to Aberdeen. That was the bus I used to always get, and, and it'd be go we'd be going to the cinema, we'd have subway, and we'd sit and eat it in a graveyard. That was pretty much my standard Saturday, uh, yeah. rocking out in the northeast of Scotland. There, um, anyway. It sound that different than suburban Canada? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, well, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have you back on, uh, Emily. Uh, it really is. So we should get into it, which is, uh, let's get our two miniaturized faces in the top corner and ask. So we will ask the question, what is a rail enthusiast? And I shall put up a uh, a rather uh, pixelated picture here of uh, possibly one of the stereotypes uh, is someone uh, trespassing on the railway uh, obliviously, standing underneath a limited clearance sign. But actually... You know, is yeah. I, I, what 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 what's your perception? What do you think of a uh, a, a railway enthusiast as? Uh, um, uh, how how would we define one of those, Emily? Do you think? I mean, my tendency is to lean towards things that are super vague, like just someone that likes railways, because I think as soon as you start picking out. You know, there's the, so many facets of that. As soon as you start picking out, oh, they like railways in this specific way, you yeah. then lose a whole group of people that don't feel included yeah, anymore. Immediately start doing the gatekeeping, which I think we will yeah. touch on later on. Yeah, exactly. And, and actually, I picked up this, this okay, boot to the Guardian, but this piece, which was written um, by, by Patience uh, Agbabi, uh, talking about her interest in train spotting and, and, and her relationship with train spotting and the way it's kind of unified her family a bit and it's quite an interesting piece and i mean it's not only you know she is a black woman 
She's a, wo a woman of color who you'd absolutely not associate with the stereotypical railway enthusiast type person. And it kind of bucks that trend. And, it, and it's interesting to pick to pick through why, why, why is this? Why do we have these images of what a train spotter is, of, of what a railway enthusiast is, of what railway fandom looks like? How can that be harmful? Um, and so, to be honest, without further ado, we shall we shall get into the story. Um, and as 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 is traditional in a rail natter, Emily has provided us a series of, of images to, to for us to, to talk through. So the first image here is well, this is a this is a metal sign that reads "Beware Rail Enthusiasts Disease," and then okay, so far so innocuous and then the next line is highly infectious to males of all ages at which point you put your head in your hands and sort of go oh, okay um tell us about this picture and, and what's the story behind what we're looking at here so i was in a you can see all the models behind me i was in a model shop yeah. in edinburgh i am not a railway model enthusiast that's all paul um but so i was just sort of bored and wandering around and came across this sign and was just like yeah, that seems pretty reflective of some, and I say definitely some of the attitudes I have seen around rail enthusiasm. In fact, my first experience of going to a rail event, um, there was a volunteer who was leading tours, and I asked a question, I have no idea what the question was, was probably very, very uninformed, and I feel like he almost rolled his eyes at me and was like, oh, there's this person. Well, I mean, I'm non-binary, but sure he read woman on this tour, doesn't know anything about trains and doesn't, you know, I'm not giving them the time. And I think that, I think that is an attitude that probably, I mean, it's an attitude that's definitely in a certain generation of railway enthusiasts. But I know we see that happening over and over again. I think, uh, is it Joanne Crompton? Her recent examples of the very sexist experience she's had on Heritage Railways. Um, you just see this attitude that sort of gets reinforced because I suspect someone buys this for their grandson or whatever. But then there's also, you know, their siblings sitting there thinking, you know, I'm a girl and I also like railways and why is this so and I think these things just I mean it's such boomer humor, but yeah, also it is, like, yeah. I do just think these things sort of feed down. And I think some of it's I don't necessarily blame people for the fact that they're like, Oh, I see a younger version of myself in this little boy. I would like to nurture him. But that's the same problem you get with like why all CEOs are yeah, exactly like, that's exactly the same perpetuation of of, of yeah. patriarchy yeah exactly yeah um and it, it there are multiple th I mean yeah there, there are a couple of things to pick out the, the other thing is that the lines blur between the kind of the the the, the dedicated enthusiast part-time like hobbyist enthusiast um sort of circle overlaps with the railway press circle and that's where a lot of the damage can be done because that's where you, the railway press circle also overlaps with actual industry with with industry yeah. and and so you get this not only is it harmful to 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 people of all you know of, of all shapes and sizes being interested in something which is always something to be nurtured and, and encouraged but also it, it leaches into industry and the damage that causes the material damage that can cause to industry yeah. itself and to the to the system it's one of the interesting things that i think railways are one of the very few industries that are creating something that isn't it's for public consumption but not in the way that like making films is made for people to watch and enjoy those yeah. films railways are made for users but not in kind of an enthusiast way but there is this whole enthusiast community that isn't necessarily part of that industry um the only other example i can think of is people obsessed with the american military the same kind yeah. of thing <laughs> you know there's just that kind of like we're really, really invested in this, but aren't actually part of the industry. And the industry isn't made for us. It's just made for people who are commuting, traveling on the railways. Yeah. But there's this whole other sector of people that may, that are, you know, really great advocates for the industry, but also it does sort of blur the lines with, as you say, journalists, with people working in the industry. Just where does that sort of fall? Yeah, and, 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 and the, yeah, and if you have people who are, sort of bringing some of the um packaged up prejudice over what constitutes a rail enthusiast or what constitutes someone who is interested in railways and they can carry that 
into their writing about industry. That's that's risky. That's that's really risky. The other thing that that aggravates me about this, and, and this is niche, but again, it it kind of it comes back to the the idea of a very a very small box of the of the enthusiast is the is this like should be encouraged to go on steam tours yeah. and that's like i i consider myself a, a well i don't know if i am a rail enthusiast i certainly i love railways which i suppose puts me into the category of rail enthusiast i'm not a big steam head i'm not hugely interested by like steam don't get me wrong i could look at a steam and, and have looked at steam locomotive for hours and looked at the the beauty of the machine and the and, and everything about it but but the reality is i'm as a, as a railway thing rather than just an object an industrial object that's interesting i find electric locomotives and diesel locomotives in the from the last 60 70 years more interesting um, and and again that that idea of the steam enthusiast is again it's very it was very boomer it's it's very much of the i mean i picked a, a picture of the people you know the the the, the thumbnail images of some you know a, a black and white image of of the people who are now in their 60s or 70s and and arguably are kind of doing some of this gatekeeping. There were kids at the time when it was Steam. And actually that, I'd say that, that and there's a whole other episode about how that causes yeah, problems for I the industry at large. Longing for the railways of their youth and things like that. Totally appreciate that. But I think, you know, it's one of the things when people find out that I have a podcast about railways, they're like, oh, I went to this great Steam railway. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, that's wonderful, but not my interest yeah. at all. but i'm so glad people yeah don't. absolutely yeah we never want to take away from that but it's uh, you know, again the idea of uh, this comes to some of the problems we have in britain at political level is the idea of the railways so many people still have the vision of a railway as this rural tipfield thunderbolt type arrangement which uh, which is which is again harmful um shall we uh, do tell me to uh, press on if you if you wish to shall we um shall we have a look at the next picture so the next picture, if I uh, make sure I'm actually running the thing properly, is, okay, a very glorious image. Um, I don't know if you want to audio describe what we're looking at right now and where, where this happens to be. So this is a, a model railway set up in the uh, Railway Museum in Bucharest. I, don't, I think it's the National Romanian Railway Museum. Um, and it's a incredible sort of turntable set up with so many different locomotives on there. Um, yeah. I realize I'm catching myself because like, I'm like, oh, I don't want to say locomote a train. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> train, train is correct. It's fine. It's linguistically correct. Screw the people who get angry about it. Those things that you learn and then that, that is that sort of imposter syndrome that comes from <laughs> yeah. being like, that's not a train, it's a locomotive. <laughs> um, anyway, so you've got the this round house there um, and then you've got this fabulous sort of scenery and, and various stations. It's not any kind of realistic recreation but this huge um rec well huge model railway um with someone operating it from a computer and when i went to this museum um there were you can't see them they're kind of behind that big hill at the back oh yeah but there's basically a place where kids can stand and look over and there were sort of I think five or six, probably boys about five, maybe oldest, they were about eight, and who were absolutely loving it, which was <laughs> obviously wonderful, and so, so excited by this model railway. But there was this, like, little girl standing behind them, not on the same podium thing that they were standing on, also looking interested, Aww. but not getting involved in the same way. And I don't, because I don't, Again, I don't want to make this all about gender because there's so many other sort yeah. of barriers that, but I did start thinking when I was looking at that, you know, these boys clearly came here frequently. They knew one another, but they weren't on a trip together. So they oh, okay, yeah. brought them very often. Um, and then I was like, well, is this something that, you know, what what is causing that? Are these boys just asking to go and the daughters aren't asking to go? Because that's totally possible. Or is the are the parents just bringing them because they're like, oh, they're little boys, they like railways. And I don't know, and I don't know what society f sort of forces reinforce that. But it was just a moment I had of going sort of, when does this start that people are different people who feel like they don't fit in with what railway enthusiasts are supposed to be get pushed away from from railway enthusiasm in, in picking up clothes for zero to three and three to six month year olds as i have been doing a little more uh, recently and um, it starts then because yeah. if you want uh 
colorful i mean okay it's the big obvious stuff like color selection you know blue pink fine but actually it's down to like if you want things that have tractors or dinosaurs or trains or anything interesting they seem to be in the boy section yeah. if you want a unicorn or and it's not even pink or blue it is like the or you want the pastel colors so the bright colors are in the boys the pastel colors independent of whether it's blue or pink but like the pastel colors are in the girl section and so it's st- that preconditioning starts right off the bat and it's quite like so i'm acutely conscious of it and trying to counteract that um but like it's it's really difficult because that it's, it's very self-select like very very quickly it's quite difficult to then you know, like, well, you know okay right fine you get you, you pick up if you've got a girl you pick up the boy stuff if you've got the if you've got a boy you might you know try and get them in some pastel colors and kind of just open the, like kind of not be like oh everything about your life has to be tractors and and football and you know you can do other things yeah. in your life um but it but starts I, that early you know it's yeah, and i also think there's as soon as you get to school i've seen, i mean i used to be a primary teacher i've seen this pressure particularly in kids in nursery if you're suddenly every single person around you has the frozen shirt yeah. um and you're a girl and suddenly you're going you know why don't i mean i have a very strong memory from my own childhood of like being in a ballet class where everyone was in a pink tutu and i was in this sort of rainbow <laughs> crazy leotard which was amazing but i was just like i don't fit in here yeah, and i think yeah. you get that reinforced immediately even if You know, I've been talking to a friend of mine whose child is, you know, gender nonconforming. And it just, the the reinforcement comes from everywhere of this is what you're supposed to be wearing. And then it becomes this is what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, which is so sad, which is so sad. Again, it's sad. Even if I you ignore if I even if I take off my expanding skills in the rail industry hat and, and just put the industry to one side, it is sad that people aren't allowed to just enjoy the things they find interesting. It's just deeply, yeah. deeply sad. So everything, everything. I mean, and this is the kind of the point. We'll, I'm, I'm sure we'll continue to emphasize this, but like, it, it's just everyone listening to this should do their very best to think about the, the little micro actions that we do that potentially um steer people one way or the other or or you know it's just little things to think about but anyway uh, we're getting ahead of ourselves oh i'm getting ahead of uh, myself um yeah that i mean it, it is a wonderful model uh, i remember loving little models like this there was one that i used to love that i remember most vigorously it's in, in a place called um uh, linmouth and the on the north devon coast that has a really nice little railway model that i think still has the same dust on it from when I was there as a small child, it's very. It looks very authentic t- for the most part, uh, but there's 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 like centimeters of dust uh, in there. Um, but it, yeah. Uh, but I, I it, it was boys. Not into model railways. Seeing this one and the one I saw at the Technical Museum in Berlin, I was like, oh, this is this is actually super interesting to just spend time and watch. And I thought, you know, maybe younger me would have enjoyed this if I'd seen it. But yeah. Yeah. I, I, was very, I was very pleased that Dina, I mean, one of the things that Dina has most, uh, my wife to li- new listeners to the show, um, is she, she loves the miniature pigs, engage pigs. They're actually it's engage piglets. They're basically the size of a, a grain of sand, these tiny things. But someone has created these engage piglets. Actually, Dina, if we had unlimited resources and not a child, uh, we might, have created a big model railway together because she absolutely loves it um uh again like she's a bit of a late epiphany she's like oh my god i love this they're so mini they're so cute what do you (laughs) such tiny little things anyway uh, i digress uh model railways let's 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 park them for a a moment yeah um i I just yeah that okay there's there again there's an enormous discussion about preconditioning and 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 you say that you don't want to just make it about gender, but that is the big obvious one, right? The big obvious one of like just narrowing down to to you know just just sort of boys, just cis boys are the only ones who can be interested in this stuff, and that's and that's that. Um, it's still about the fact that we're in this day and age that that is still kind of being applied. Um, is it's yeah. insidious. I mean, I don't know, I, because obviously my experience is as a white person, so that's the experience yeah. I have. I don't know about the sort of other experience of people who are disabled or people, you know, have had as racist experiences trying to get involved in railway enthusiasm. But I think, yeah, the gender one is so obvious because you just see that replicated over and over again. And, and, and maybe to put, and you might, you know, apologies, I'm shooting you, Fox, we might be getting ahead of, of things here, is one of the things I have noticed, particularly through the community that's built up around this podcast, hello all of you lovely people who watch and, and support the show, is is that actually there is two two things firstly there is quite a strong gender non-conforming presence or or yeah. a kind of a a non-cis presence within railway enthusiasm which is which is which is cool and that and and, and 
also there's quite a strong presence of neurodiversity within so I, okay there's a stereotype of the autistic yeah, you know, kind of like train spotter, which I think can be pretty harmful. But actually, there is a genuine appreciation. There's a genuine understanding, certainly within the the rail natter community, um, which is again quite young. Actually, as a community, is it, like people who have an understanding of their new diversities or their friends' new diversities, yeah. and and they and that's that's kind of it's seen only as a kind of a, a, a part of the broader diversity of the, of, of that enthusiasm and, and and so yeah again i'm getting ahead of ourselves but there's that there is a bit of hope in the, in the younger people yeah. who are interested in realizing that's what i definitely want to move on to because i think definitely younger people are so much more celebratory of those sorts yeah. of things yeah. i find that most of my railway enthusiast friends i am on the very sort of upper cusp of them i'm 35 and i'm like i'm kind of at the top end of people that i know there's obviously a few older people that I know um, who I get on with well, but it just feels like that community has really blossomed, especially among people, you know, gender diversity, neurodiversity, all yeah. of that amongst younger railway enthusiasts. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we jump forwards. So that was Bucharest. We've jumped to Budapest. Yes. Tell me about it. So this is already, already I'm excited because I love doing all public transport in other cities. So okay. <laughs> tell us about it. I'm wearing my Budapest uh, trolley bus top, um, which I really hope profits of didn't go to Orban's government. Uh. I was like, oh, I'll just buy this and let's see. Um, but one of the things that I think can really make things better is create ways that people can get into the railway or other forms of transport that aren't just going to or having some interaction with a museum. Yeah. Um, and that's not to say that museums aren't brilliant and do brilliant work. It's just that most of them cost money. Mm. Most of them involve a sort of trip to get to. And um, that means there's all sorts of barriers, whether that's, you know, financial whether or people physical or just in terms of people, particularly parents feeling they don't have the cultural capital to be there. Yeah. They might not speak the language. They can't tell the ki their kids what the signs say. There's yeah. so many barriers. Um, you know, when I was a primary teacher in Northeast London, most of those kids never left Tottenham. That was their experience. So saying, oh, there's a railway museum they can go to. There's all sorts of railway events they can go to. That's not necessarily going to happen. And what I really liked about Budapest is obviously this is somewhat for tourists, but it's also just these are things you can do in your community that are occasional historic vehicles we run or a historic system that still exists that you can use. And I think that was... I think that's always a way that makes it more accessible to anyone. I mean, these just run on the standard routes. Um, that DH tram at the bottom, that just runs on the standard yeah, yeah. regular yeah. route, which is like, great, you can just get on that and be interested in it yeah, and yeah. go online and find out more and things like that. And I think, I think, I know there are sort of health and safety reasons that sometimes these sort of things can't be done. But, you know, I think, if you run, which they often do, run heritage trains on on London Transport or on uh, elsewhere in the country, it's just kind of like they just get people more interested, but just making them part of, instead of making them a sort of special, you have to pay for this event. Yeah, and often very expensive. Yeah, yeah often inc incredibly expensive, which obviously I get it. Museums need to fundraise or preservation organizations need to fundraise. But I think that actually kind of Oh, this is just, they used to run the 15 bus. They used to run route masters on the 15 bus route that were just the same as any yeah, other yeah. bus. And it was really positive, I think. I, 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 this is one of the things that, you know, I, it's really sad that we don't do more of that in amongst, okay, we have a very congested rail network and there are very kind of specific parameters that mean that often running heritage yeah. stock as uh, on the timetable can be a problem. But for God's sake, we've run pacers as as the, on the timetable for, for so long that we can, come on, you know, having a pacer still running a couple of the service, you know, non-peak time services on a weekend or something, well, actually not on a weekend, probably during the weekday, things like that. We could do that and it could, and it could just be part of the timetable and part of just something for interest yeah absolutely uh, it's, it's yeah, an opportunity missed um buses are much better at doing that like yeah. heritage days all the time where they're just running heritage buses that you can just get on the same as any other bus um and i think 
yeah, there are limitations, but just having this visible, like, oh, I could take that old tram, you know, the metro is, you know, just telling you that. And I think London Transport is actually quite good at having mm. signage about yes. about the history of things. Um, I mean, I'm calling it London Transport because I'm in history mode. TFL <laughs> yeah. is quite good at that, um, as are other railways. But I think to actually see those vehicles coming through or sort of have that more tangible experience with it just as a member of the public really opens up doors for people. I think, yeah, you think of the time when we were Metro and how nice it'd be to have, like, one of the original Metro cars in, yeah. like, the original livery running through in amongst all these lovely new ones that they've got. That, that's a nice, that'd be a nice thing. And they just do it as, you know, I hope they are holding a couple back to do precisely that. Um, fingers crossed. Uh, not least because you can't ride the, at the front in the new ones. Very sad. Um, yeah, this is brilliant. And I, I love I love this. It's almost like facilitating a thing that I often do when I go to a city, which is yeah. get get the rider pass and, and ride on as many different <laughs> things as I possibly can. We, we, we went to Istanbul and back. Every city we were in, we were there for a day and we're like, let's do all the... Yeah. <laughs> One day in Budapest in which these things were open and we went to three transport museums, the Children's Railway, that number 60 <laughs> rack railway. We were like, oh, yeah. we will hit every stop because, oh, yeah, we did that chairlift as well. Oh, nice. It's just, you know, that's a great way to see a city and sort of explore its history. But oftentimes those things aren't advertised. Sometimes I get places and I'm like, oh, they have this historic thing, but no idea. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. That's It's a really... As you say, that the, the, all sorts of barriers. It's, it's not just you know, museums or, or special events that are a special thing. If there's big crowds, that obviously then potentially excludes lots of people who are neurodiverse or disabled because they, 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 it's difficult for them to get access to these things. So, yeah, having it as a, as a bit of a standard run-of-the-mill thing where it's not such a big deal and doesn't have you know huge crowds blocking up is, is a good thing. <clears throat> so, talking of which, we jump to the next. Uh, we jump to the next slide. Um, Emily. Which is also in Budapest. It is also in Budapest. I was so impressed with its transport, everything they had transport history-wise. Um, and this was a complete coincidence to end up on this tram. And this is, I mean, Hungarian is literally the hardest language in the world to learn. I think they found that in a study. So I don't <laughs> speak a word of it. But um, this is the sort of how it works tram. If, to sort of roughly translate the idea. And you can see, we got on this tram, just happened to get randomly on this tram, and I don't know how many of them there are in service, but you can see they just have these open windows with all the mechanics of the tram on show. Um, and then you've got like the numbers there. You can see particularly the top image, you can see the numbers really well. And then you've got signage and then it has all the numbers and it explains how each one of those things works. It's all in Hungarian, so we took photos. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It all. But like, it's just... That's so, I've never seen anything yeah. like this before. And I was like, it's such an obvious idea. I've seen things like this in museums, but just on a- Just on a regular ass train, running tram, yeah. running around. Getting in service. And it was so funny because we were, Paul and I were just like, this is so amazing. <laughs> and all the Hungarian people on the tram were just like, these people are way over the top. <laughs> it was so exciting to see something. And it's just, it makes, it makes things so accessible. And they also, on the Metro system, had like bits of the the tunnel lining while well, in the station, so in sort of one of the concourses of the station, that they'd sort of peeled back, put a glass thing. Oh, fantastic. Behind what was there. And you just think, this is a way that anyone could just read about this and be like, hey, this is interesting to me. There's a QR code. I think it advertises places you could go to learn more because there's so many transport museums in Budapest. And you just think, yeah, why? I'm sure this doesn't cost very much more to do, but just makes it seem like something that anyone could learn about. And, you know, I mean, it sounds very grandiose, but, you know, someone could be sitting looking at this and going, I really like this stuff. I'd like to become an engineer. I'd like to become an electrician. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that, that's the thing that was just buzzing in my head of how many more people does this, without all the traditional barriers to access that you normally get, if you do it, you know, if you're trying to, you know, going through school and you've got a careers advisor, um, it's a hopeless way to know about what jobs exist, frankly. It's not to do down careers advisors. It's just the fact that the, the, the job market is dynamic and huge yeah. and complicated. Um, this, you just have to, you know, if you've got this on a bus or on a tram or on a train, 
there is no barrier to entry for you as a as a you know a an eight year old whatever whatever you happen to you know, but a young person looking at this and going that's really interesting or even you know a teenager going you know what that absolutely fascinates me i i want to I want to make that happen, or I think I could do something di- different and better than what I can see there. I've got had an idea. Yeah, you know, like maybe I'll go and, and and become a mechanical mechanical engineer and do that. Just yeah, exactly as you say. The 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 the, the fact that this is another op, you know, this is probably the, the 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 highest number of people you could get seeing getting exposed to to transport engineering and transport processes is is with a thing like this is brilliant. I love this so much. It was so, and you know, when I tweeted this, it went. People loved it. They were so excited about this as a concept. And, you know, I remember when I was a kid, I had sort of 17, 18, a friend of mine was going to study engineering. And I was like, I genuinely don't even know what engineering means. Um, It just, I didn't know any engineers. And it seemed like a very abstract concept to me. And, you know, I obviously don't know what this says in Hungarian. Maybe there's a uh, a watcher who who can read in Hungarian. But it is that kind of like this this makes it visible what what you do as an engineer or what you might do if you were working on transport in this way. Yeah, absolutely. It's brilliant. I just love this. It's it's no wonder that that your tweets on it went went big because it's just such a cool, clever idea. Um, Everyone watching this who has any control over anything in transport – it's on you. Work out how to introduce this onto some trains and trams. Um, oh, and then and then we we kind of we end uh, with the bot the back end of a bus. But um, uh, yeah, this the, 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 tell us the story about this and 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 round us off. But this is a really nice. I, I love this. The, the, we've already touched on this. I think it's really nice. One of the things that I think is. Um a place where I always find the most diversity in a transport enthusiast event is a bus depot open day. So this one is, I believe from when I went to the Stockwell bus depot open day, I'm not, I'm not a vehicle person. That's not (laughs) my expertise. So I didn't take many pictures. I only took this because I've got some sort of friends who yearn for the days of the GLC. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. (laughs) So one of my GLC fandom friends. Um, But I just find these days, you know, the first time I went to one, I thought, eh, it'll be a bunch of vehicles. It'll be a bunch of people who just want to take photos of the vehicles and know all the precision aspects of the vehicles, the stuff that I find quite alienating. And I think anyone new to fandom of buses finds quite alienating. It's sort of, you know, if you if that's what you find first and that's not what you're interested in, it can be so out off putting, yep. which is why it took me to finding people whose enthusiasm was actually for riding vehicles yeah. and going on journeys on the vehicles. And I'm not really necessarily about sort of gricing and rare track, but I do like getting to visit different stations and things like that. So it took me a long time to find people who were into that. And if your first experience is just people who are into a totally different aspect of transport enthusiasm than you are, then that that's quite alienating. And so I thought when I went to the bus depot, the first bus depot open day I went to, it would be a lot of that. Um, And then I found that actually these are the most diverse events of any Mm. kind of transport enthusiasm thing I've gone to because there's so much in the local community. They're not expensive and families are looking for a day out that they can just do. I'm sure they advertise on bulletin boards in schools and things like Mm. that. You know, they're just so local that they are incredibly accessible in many ways, probably not necessarily very physically accessible because they're mostly old buses. But, you know, in terms of cost, in terms of just being able to get there, um, I just find every time I go to a bus open day, I'm just amazed by the range of people of different ages, races, backgrounds. It's just really, really exciting to me. And who are so excited about the buses? It's families, it's you know, there's lots of teenagers who are kind of running yeah. around with their big digital SLR cameras who are, you know, <laughs> yeah. very, very keen to take their photos of them. So I just think, I think that there's there's got to be a way that sort of railway enthusiasm can, can, can do similar things. I don't know. And I don't know what that is. I don't know whether that's sort of station open days. And I know there's all sorts of health and safety things. And this is, of course, that other 
that other issue that we were kind of getting at before, you know, I'm just an enthusiast. I don't work in the industry. I don't see the barriers that maybe people who are working in a station go, absolutely, we could not do that. But I do think creating things like this that make the transport history accessible, you know, those teenagers that were going around taking photos might have met at an event like this yeah, when they yeah. were younger. They might have met on some forum and said, oh, we both live locally, let's get together here. I think particularly for people like myself who are neurodiverse, who maybe don't necessarily find friendships that easily in their schools or in their community and can connect at places like this that are easy to get to. I just think every time I go to a bus open day, I'm like, I don't really care this much about the buses, but I'm so excited yeah. that people are enthusiastic and people are, are looking at them and people are, there's such a diverse group of people here. Absolutely. And I think it's, it's that, it's that community presence that you, that, that really captures, that captivates me about this story that you told in, in that, you know, I think, well, railway stations are generally in amongst the community. There's an opportunity, you know, and, and obviously we have community rail partnerships that exist that are, that are great. Um, that Treasury are currently asking to have all the funding uh, funding cut from, um, but that's another story. But the, but those community rail partnerships are potentially an opportunity to build on some of that because the railway station, you don't need to. Yes, okay, you can get into the discussions of oh, well, you know, the, there's a gate line and there's a you know, and the platform and and the safety. Like, absolutely, we have to manage that safety. But but that shouldn't be. That should shouldn't be seen as a reason to say no. It should be a reason. It should be a thing that you think about as part of facilitating yes to create kind of turning these states and part of the problem is that the stations have, we've, we've lost those uh, as you know lost the feeling of stations as, as community hubs that, that that's gone a bit um yeah and whereas you look at the you know the, the idea of bus step is an okay so london benefits from a huge range of of lovely inner city bus steppers in a way that lots of places outside of london sold those uh, for development but there are still bus depots around. There are still bus depots in communities. Nottingham certainly has centrally located bus depots. Uh, York has a couple of centrally-ish located bus depots. There, there are opportunities. I, I just, I love this. I absolutely love this. And, and as you say, the fact that it just taps into a, a slice of society that is very different from the slice of society that you'll get at a heritage railway, or that yeah. you'll get on, you know, travelling on a on a charter train. For me, that's yeah. that's a, that's an exciting opportunity. So I'm not going to most heritage railways because they exist in places that you need to take a car to yep. or a convoluted bus journey. And for a lot of people who live in, in urban centers, that's also the case. Um, and I think having things in your community is so important. You can see that, I mean, some of those days, open days at uh, tube stations that, I know you've had Anne on the podcast before, mm. but, um, that Anne has, worked with yeah. um and those kind of things that sort of celebrate uh the you know people come open days and things like that where people want to come and and see different things at a station they do so many of those in london i don't know how many of them happen elsewhere at smaller stations but one of the things i see with podcasts you know when people talk about our podcast and going to every single station those stations mean so much to yeah. people and those are so much a part of their life and that's having something that that opens a door within those stations is so exciting to people whether that's in a sort of quite rural station or it's in central london absolutely uh, and it's just it's an opportunity that that keeps on giving you know we could sit here and get increasingly excited about the the ways that this opens doors and uh, opens doors for different groups of people uh, both into giving, you know, having a hobby, a thing that creates friendships, as you say, that aren't nat that people who aren't so comfortable at creating friendships in more conventional settings, it, that creates, you know, just it just gives people interest in the industry as advocates of it, as campaigners for it, and indeed as practitioners of it. You know, there's just so many options. We could talk for hours and hours about it, but we're not going to. But I think that just a glimpse of that in that 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 why that there the benefits of widening and 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 creating a more inclusive environment for transport enthusiasm for railway fandom is it's just the gift that keeps on giving really there there are no downsides to it none at all 
Um, and 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 I think yeah. Uh, and and having a bus, we 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 don't talk about buses enough on Rail Natter. Um, we love this is this is very much a pro bus podcast, even though we we do have rail in the name. So yeah, it's nice nice for us to end uh, on a bus. Any before we before we uh, round out, anything you want to uh, give our, our closing words on, on this, Emily? I think. Um, I just think we need to make sure that anytime someone comes to an event or starts talking to new people or joins a forum or something like that, unless they're doing something that is highly offensive, if they don't know things about railways, if they're not interested in that same niche thing, I think we just have to make sure that we're being, we're thinking, how can we get this person involved? It's just that thing that I think puts so many people off is, oh, they were talking about dual gauge trains and I didn't know what that meant. And then suddenly I felt like I didn't, I was, I didn't belong there. I think there is just that let everyone start from zero and include them and teach them and people will find their own way into the things that interest them. And that's never going to be everything. But I think we just have to accept that, you know, my enthusiasm is riding on vehicles and going on journeys and looking at architecture and things like that. Other people's is making sure they've gone on every bit of track or it's the specifics of specific vehicles. And there's there's place for everyone. There. Absolutely. Yeah. Widen the tent, more umbrellas, get everyone involved. Absolutely. Oh, Emily. We, I mean, we'll 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 come back again at at at, at the end. But but we should first um, press on with the uh, the closure of the episode because otherwise we'll we'll talk for hours and hours because it's a, it's a subject close to both of our hearts. Um, everyone who's listened to this in audio only form, I hope we've done adequate levels of audio description. I should have said in the last ep- the picture was a bus with some people getting onto it, and it was in a rather nice brutalist, um, actually possibly not brutalist, but early concrete skin um, depot. It looked glorious. Anyway, now enough of that. Um, uh, all the only people yeah thank you for listening uh, drop a review if you and your listening place because apparently that's helpful I, I don't understand the system um uh i also uh yes uh, patreon.com slash gareth to continue to support the episode paypal.me slash gareth dennis to support the episode but you get the added benefit of just throwing loose change and abuse at me that's nice um and gareth dennis to code uk slash merchandise for the mer- uh, slash merch sorry for the merchandise uh, of which there is a decent amount if you have an idea for something else, some other nonsense that you want on a mug or a t-shirt give me a shout um we have raised quite a lot of money that will be going to um york lgbt forum which is nice because one of our t-shirts is a, 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 couple, a, couple, a design that i did which was uh, the first of hopefully a couple of other designs um sort of uh, kind of uh, pro trans rights uh, t-shirt there's a lot of um people a lot of trans people who support rail natter are interested in the show and um and this is very much a vigorously pro trans um uh, podcast so it's nice that we're raising i think we've raised like a hundred quid for york lgbt forum which is okay in the grand scheme of things not a huge amount of money but every little helps and um for a small charity they, they do a lot of stuff so hopefully 100 quid helps them on top of our um cash from the live show from two years ago anyway and also the discord the chat hello everyone in the chat sorry but it's, it's not it's a pre-record so we haven't said much to you but hi, hi everyone in the chat uh gareth sends to cut uk slash discord oh um Emily, it'd be remiss of me to uh, not once again just say, everyone, if you're not already listening and subscribed and have have given reviews and and generally done as much plugging as you can for Randall Round We Go, uh, the podcast, go do that. It's wonderful. Um, uh, What's the latest on on episodes? We always get an episode update, uh, Emily. Slow, high-quality content, so it's always good to get an update. Yeah, we... It's always a thing that we get out eight episodes and then we're like, okay, we need a break from this now. Yeah. But we are getting back into it. Unfortunately, of course, once it gets very hot and we close ourselves in the little office with all the, it, it it's a bit of a pain to, to record yeah. them. Um, but yeah, we've recorded one. We're just about to record the second of our eight. We usually record five before we start releasing them, and then hope we don't pull out King's Cross or something that's going <laughs> to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Last time we had like we've got three weeks to do Tottenham Court Road. Oh my goodness me! Spoken about the Crossrail project on this podcast before. Oh no! (laughs) Good It's like right. He started just books. He just like started clearing shelves for the. Oh, good grief! Yeah. We can cover that in more detail later. That's a that's a big one. But yeah, so that's. I don't have a date, unfortunately, because we don't like to try make promises that we can't keep. Um, But yeah, it's it's coming at some point so that's ongoing how many epi- how many stations have you now done 
in total? 24. Um, so, you know, only 248 to go, yeah. I think. <laughs> hey, what you did was create yourself a content machine that you would not run out of anytime soon. This was this was skilled podcast series creation. Uh, you, you don't want to pick. You wouldn't want to like I don't know pick um, suburban railway stations in Sheffield, for example, because you'd have a very short episode run. Well, this is the thing. People are like, "Oh, are you going to do the DLR stations? Are you going to do the overground stations?" I was like, "We're going to die before we finish this." Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I shouldn't laugh, but yeah, I know, but it's it's true. Like it's it's a project that will uh, maybe we won't die before we finish it. I think maybe when we're much older, we can really really dig into it. But it is one of those things that it's just it's going to take a very very long. But it's time. so beautifully crafted, like such the, the, just the beautifully crafted episodes. Uh, I say this with a certain irony, given the state of my podcast. But it's a different sort of content. Let's put it that way. But um, but yeah, it's so, it's so beautifully crafted that I think people are just willing to wait to let you both do what you want to do with you know, to create the episodes that you want to create and not not rush into them i think there's a, there's a yeah. real beauty to that it's been so wonderful and you know we've had people people who write the books that we use as sources uh anthony badsy ellis get, got in touch with us saying you know how much he's enjoying it and and giving us he's like if you ever need anything oh uh, you know so people like that and then uh there's what what we're really excited about which is not actually really related to the podcast there is a listener who lives in Canada who was at Heroin Wheelstone um, the day of the Heroin Wheelstone crash. Oh, my goodness. Uh, worked for London Transport for years, then moved to Canada. And he, through complete coincidence, lives in a place where my parents have to go for a funeral while Paul and I are in Canada. So we're like, can you just drive us and we're going to go visit this guy. So it's, it, you know, he sent us photos of his days working in London oh. Transport. So it's just been so amazing just... to kind of connect with all these people that that love the tube. It's absolutely wonderful. I, I just, yeah, I, I just, cannot, just cannot recommend it enough, everyone. Go go, go, go listen. Uh, go support Round Round, Round We Go. Um, everything that you can. Go do it. Provide the support. That's not all in terms of plugs. In fact, also, there may be other plugs, which you're more than welcome to put up, Emily. But I thought one of the things that, that caught my interest is that you were, uh, you said you were doing some speaking, and you've been speaking this week. Okay, not the week this episode goes out, because this episode's going out in uh, a few weeks. But... As of the we're recording it, this is still Better Transport Week, uh, a, a campaign organised by a campaign or a a sub campaign organised by the campaign for Better Transport. Tell tell us about tell us a little bit about what what you can about um, Better Transport Week, and particularly I suppose the Better by Bus element, which was was it was it day two was it Tuesday was bus yeah, day Tuesday. So their it's for their fiftieth anniversary. The campaign for Better Transport mm. is doing this. Um, week celebrating better transport each day is a different kind of initiative so one was rail day two was bus um the, the, i'm not sure exa I, I don't want to misquote them but there was a whole sort of campaign about sort of ride to rail so the cycling thing yeah um, so it's basically so celebrating different ways that people can get around um and i spoke at their i was sort of their bus representative so to speak uh which is hilarious because the guy on the left works for go ahead and this is proper uh, proper bus person. <laughs> yeah. i just like i like riding buses but um so I got involved in that, which was really good. And one of the things we did is their campaign for the bus day was Thank a Driver Day. Mm, so yeah, we went yeah. to Ash Grove and took some photos with some of the drivers there who were lovely. I'm so not, you know, I'm. this is something that's come from obviously this going viral riding buses, but I'm not the like, I'll go on a photo shoot and like pose with people kind of person, but it actually was a lot of fun. And the drivers were really, really lovely. Um, yeah, the guy at the back there, Enrique. He was like, he was, he was, he was a born model. He was just keen to get. Involved. I was gonna say that's he's he's just he that looks like a pose. He is just absolutely naturally assumed. He's like, yeah, I know what I'm doing here. He was every pose. Where he'd be like, you know, they they kept telling us to do thumbs up, but he'd have the hand up, or he'd be like, we did this one handshake out the bus window. I was like, I'm because I got to <laughs> sit in the front of the bus and got to pretend to be a driver. It was lots amazing. Of fun. Um, but also just you know celebrating buses and and drivers particularly it is a very very difficult job absolutely i mean 
I don't. I can't, I can't even decide whether I think being a, a urban. I have terrible depth perception, so I think being an urban bus driver would be difficult. But also, some of those turnarounds that I've been on buses, rural buses that do in sort of random lanes. Yeah, it, it is a very, very difficult skill job, and that doesn't even mention dealing with the people, which is a huge. Yeah, yeah, like the, the, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, we we definitely need to get we need to get a bus driver on this episode actually, because it'd be great to have a chat with some bus drivers. Um, yeah, I, I just just so true. I I, I have a, a small thing to point out which is so you're delivering a, a bit of a, a presentation here a, a bit of a, a bit of a speech here at the kind of the launch uh, kind of in advance of the event the launch here it, looking fabulous but um very close second is this gentleman here um sat by the sat at the end in, a, in an absolutely fabulous suit I, I, I don't know if you can can you see the picture here? That's, uh, norman baker i think ex uh m- uh, Lib Dem MP slash ex minister from the coalition government. It is it is a great suit. <laughs> that is, I'm 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 captivated by that suit and tie combination. It's very very impressive. Um, uh, anyway, I, not not that we should be you know just focusing on uh, what Norm Baker is wearing, but um, is uh, that Norm Baker? Am I, is that is that a person? Is he? I don't want to admit, say him. Is, is his name wrong? I, I, the chap here with the the chap here sat at the back. Who, XMP. He's an XMP uh, allegedly. Uh, Mar- anyway, um, yeah. So that's so that's still going on. So I mean, uh, hopefully, I mean, not, not when people listen to this episode. But anyway, we <laughs> something for us to look out for while uh, today and tomorrow. Well, today, uh, I presume it'll be over the weekend as well. So there might be some stuff going on. Um, I mean, yeah, and the, it's been it, one of the things that has been really great about going viral for riding buses is just getting involved in events. And, you know, I spoke at the TFL bus director at away day. And part of it is like, I know they're just this is someone who will speak for free. But at the same time, it's really it's really lovely to be a voice of someone who just likes traveling on these services, has experience traveling on these services. Um, and instead of being someone who's actually in the industry and knows more not that i think very very valuable for people in the industry who know a lot more um but it is one of those things that's quite exciting we, to get a different perspective I, think. I was gonna say we don't hear that often from passengers <laughs> just don't we don't and it's a problem for all on all sorts of levels but it's nice to have it's nice for there to be someone becoming well, already have become prominent who's just speaking for people who travel yeah. enjoy traveling you know the, the who, who kind of represent the joy of traveling and their enthusiasm which is absolutely you emily um right before we before we uh before we close out i shall just say that next week's episode uh i don't know well, in the future gareth what is next week's episode i have uh what what is I, I i don't know me from the future is talking to us now i'm about to and uh, telling us what the episode is yeah well, well if you give me a moment to speak good grief um yeah next week it is a it's a news episode uh it's a news episode uh yes dave Grohl uh took the train and other little stories um back to you past past gareth okay fine marvelous thanks thanks past uh f- no thanks future me uh for organizing whatever that episode would be might be a guest might not be a guest could be a news episode who knows it only remains really emily to just say that was a that was a lovely episode i'm I, thanks so much we, we talked we, we wanted to do this for ages and we finally got around to doing it i'm so pleased um it's a joy to have you on all the time um and i look forward to the next time we find something else to to chat about it could I'm be christmas sure could be before I- I'm trying to write a book about traveling on buses. At least my agent wants me to write a book about traveling on buses. So maybe I'll talk about that. Uh, I actually have to do the writing, but maybe I'll talk about don't, it. Don't, don't talk to me about doing. Oh my goodness! Yeah, I, no, that's 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 one for <laughs> a little peek behind the curtain there for long-time fans of the show. Anyway, um, Emily, uh, it only remains really for, for for me to say goodbye to you and for um, uh, everyone uh, watching. Uh, che- cheerio, everyone! Uh, actually, Emily, don't disappear because I'll run the credits and then I'll say a proper goodbye. Uh, peek behind the curtain again, everyone. You get lots of peek behind the curtain, everyone watching. Anyway, we're just waving. Yeah, we're just waving chaotically. Cheerio! Cheerio, everyone. <laughs> Cheerio.